So. Hey. So, uh, I gotta explain some things a bit before we actually start this video. So, if you, you've been looking at my community posts and Twitter, you'd know that a good chunk of this video has been lost. I was considering re-editing it or trying to find a way to work around it, but it just wasn't possible. I really wanted to have this video out before the release of Spider-Man 2. So, this video will be missing the planned sections of gameplay and side content. I'm recording this improv right now. I don't have a script for this. But anyways, yeah. Gameplay and side content, those are the two sections, which total to over an hour that I edited are not going to be in this video. So, yeah, that kind of sucks. But, I mean, there's not really much I can do besides edit those sections again. And again, like I said, like, that's over an hour that I have to redo. And even then, if I decide to try and edit it from where it stopped, that's still, like, 35 minutes, and I don't really think I have that much time, and honestly, I really don't feel like releasing this on Friday, because I really just want to play Spider-Man 2 that day, come on. So, while this video is technically incomplete, th thankfully, those two sections were not really the entire reason I was making this video. So let me just say right now that even though those sections are missing, I don't want this video to be any less special than it already is. I was very disappointed when it happened, when I, I found out the files were corrupted. I was disappointed, and yet I still am, but I'm not sad or mad or anything. Please don't try to apologize for me in the comments or try to pity me, because now I... I don't really care, honestly. It's fine. It happens, really. Especially with, like, huge projects like this. Honestly, I was kind of surprised that I wasn't expecting there to be some huge roadblock like this. So, in short, gameplay, traversal, and combat, they're both extremely fun. They have a lot of flaws, but they're still extremely fun and very, like, in-depth. Insomniac perfected them, and they're even going to perfect them more in the sequel, which pretty much every single one of my problems with each of them being addressed in said sequel. So, yeah. And then side content, it's all pretty much really fun. Yeah, that's basically a TLDR of what you missed. One day I might remake those sections, who knows. But, yeah. Thankfully... The real reason I wanted to make this video was for the story, and the other sections, history and presentation, those two are intact too, so I just decided to include those. Especially history, I did really want to include those. Presentation does feel kind of out of place, but hey, I edited it, why would I just let it go to waste? So here's just a disclaimer. A lot of these thing, a lot of the things I'm going to say in this video are going to like tie back to the sections that I made and wrote for, edited for, and they're not going to make sense because they're not in here. Like, there's going to be transitions to the sections, I'll warn you when that's coming, that transitions right to the story, and there's some other sections where I call back to those two parts of the video where I, like, call back to them and, like, say whatever. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of things I say in this video aren't going to make sense, and I don't really feel like going back and redoing all that. I didn't want to rush this video, but I did feel like I kind of rushed the those two sections anyways. So honestly, I think it's kind of a blessing in disguise and kind of like a red herring, like telling me that it's just not worth it to go through all that stress trying to remake it or anything. I was panicking at first, but now I've just kind of accepted it. It sucks that I had to lose those sections, but there isn't much I can do. And that leads into the final thing I wanted to say. I feel like after this video comes out, I'm going to take a short little break from YouTube. 
we'll still do reactions, and it's not anything personal in my life going on, not at all. My personal life is completely fine. Do not worry about me at all. It's just that I'm not really sure. Making this video specifically, it sure was a lot of work. I spent, like, most of my free time throughout the past uh, couple of months just trying to get this done. And I feel like maybe that kind of took away from, like, my actual life doing the other things I enjoy. Staying active, stay exercising, hanging out with friends. And I, I still did those things. I did those things plenty of times. But I still want to focus on those things more than anything else. I enjoy making YouTube videos, but they're not my priority. Like I said, I know a lot of people say this, but I'm genuinely not in it for the fame or the money or anything. I'm just doing it to have fun and share some of my interests with y'all. That's, that's it. So yeah. I'm going to take a short break, probably until I complete both Spider-Man 2 and Mario Wonder, and we're just going to see how long that takes. We're still doing rea reactions, I might have already said that. I'm still, I still want to do reactions to, like, death battles and stuff, but as for the solo reviews, the big season rankings, and others, those are going to be held on hold for a while. Hope y'all understand. Okay. So, even though it's incomplete, this video is still very special to me, and I really hope y'all enjoy it. Alright, have fun. Let me tell y'all why Marvel Spider-Man on the PlayStation 4 is my favorite game of all time. Until tomorrow. If you've ever asked me what my favorite game of all time was, I used to never be able to give a straight answer. And that's because I just have so many games that I'd consider my favorite. Obviously, with Mario being my favorite fictional franchise, most of its games can be considered that. But even outside that series, there's games like Sonic Mania, Shovel Knight, Arkham Asylum, Breath of the Wild, Pikmin 3, Deathloop, and even some more recent releases like Tears of the Kingdom and Hi-Fi Rush have climbed their way up there. However, nowadays, I think that I finally figured out what I'm confident in calling my favorite game of all time. And that is Balan Wonderworld. Alright, fine, y'all already know from the title of this video, I'm not tricking anyone. It's Marvel's Spider-Man on the PlayStation. Never before have I played a game where I consistently have interest in it, and coming back is something I can do at any time. Even some of my favorites I just mentioned, I usually have to wait a while before having the urge to replay it. Marvel Spider-Man, however, is not only a game that I have found fun at any time no matter how long my last playthrough was, but it also stays at the exact same level of enjoyment for me. I've wanted to talk about this game on this channel for so long, but I just never knew what I should do. Ideas sprinkled in my head, such as ranking every costume, or giving an analysis on the ending specifically, but after some thought, I believe that this game deserves a whole entire video essay. It's a game that holds some specialty in my heart, not only just because I have so many fond memories of playing it. I want to share said experiences with y'all to their fullest extent. Before I get into anything else though, I've got to mention a few things. Firstly, I am not a critic. I criticize things and talk about my problems and what I think should be improved, but I am nowhere near the level that others are when it comes to specifically pointing out and noticing every little detail of something. This video is mostly intended for my personal experiences with the game and what I thought of the package as a whole. If you want an in-depth critique of the game, I'd heavily recommend you watch White Light's video. He goes into so much detail on every little thing, and is way better at actually dissecting said things than, again, me. He also made a similar video on Miles Morales too, so I'd recommend that one as well. Another thing I wanted to mention is that most of the footage in this video is not mine. I mean, I have the regular game on PS4, the remastered version on PS5, 
and on PC as well, meaning that I can record gameplay for it. However, due to time constraints and just making my life a heck of a lot easier, I'll be pulling most of the footage from the PlayStation Nation's walkthrough of the game, as it basically shows everything there is to do in the game. Also, it is the regular version that was made for the PS4, not the remastered version. However, I actually kind of prefer it to be this way. I want this video to be me telling y'all why I love this game so much. And the original version on PS4 is the first time I played it, and it's how I ended up adoring it so much. So it's sort of sentimental there. I'll have the other sources linked in the description if I pull it from other places besides PlayStation Nation. Oh, and by the way, I will not be talking about the DLC for this game, The City That Never Sleeps. I would have loved to, but again, mostly because of time constraints. And plus, I really just want to focus on the base game here for the same reason as me using footage from the original non-remastered version. I didn't even play the DLC until I got said remastered version. I might end up making a video on the DLC at a later time, who knows. I want to have this video show my full, unfiltered thoughts of the game, why it became my favorite game of all time, and things that could be approved upon in the sequel, and have already been in Miles Morales. So, let me just go ahead and say that every criticism I have does not take away from my experience at all. They all come from a place of love. And before we truly get into it, this video is actually a cross-release with a video Capsirus made on the Kirby series. It's an equally special video to celebrate his favorite gaming franchise, and me and him both would massively appreciate it if you checked it out. This is basically our Barbenheimer. Cap Siri boy, if you will. It would mean a lot to both of us if you watched both of these videos as we both worked hard on them. Alright, let's get into it now. I'm so excited. If you want to know the sections, then I'll have them posted here. I tried to be as in-depth as possible for this one, more than I have for anything I have ever before if I'm being honest. I want to show just how much I adore this game. So without further ado, let's get into it. Throughout history, there have been plenty of Spider-Man games. There were some minor ones like side-scrollers on handhelds and even some mobile games, and then there's whatever the Atari game was. But the Spider-Man games that people still talk about today are the big boy console releases, with games like Spider-Man 2 and Web of Shadows both being talked about today as some of the best Spider-Man experiences you could possibly get on a game system. Helped by its open world and ability to swing around and just... be Spider-Man. Even games like the 2000 game on PlayStation, Maximum Carnage, and even Shattered Dimensions are all still really well known and have a massive fan base. However, it was clear that what people really wanted was a return to the format of being able to swing around wherever you wanted, fight crime, and do whatever a spider can do in a massive playground of a city. People would always come back to Spider-Man 2 specifically as the definitive Spider-Man experience that a fan could possibly have. And even though that game is still beloved even today, it was clear that it was starting to show its age. People wanted a fresh new adventure involving the wall crawler. And during Sony's E3 2016 conference, they got just that. Near the tail end of the presentation, People were greeted by the sights of New York City, and then they saw Spider-Man, with a tiny, just tiny little amount of gameplay because it was still in very early development, to show how it was a return to form, another Spider-Man game to the likes of how people have clamored for. And this time, unlike the two games I mentioned earlier that had many different companies helming development such as Treyarch, Vicarious Visions, and Amaze Entertainment just to name a few, this game would be developed by one Insomniac Games. While Insomniac had made plenty of games, they are definitely most well known for being behind the Ratchet & Clank franchise. A series of games exclusive to the PlayStation hardware, though you can't play some of them on PC, that has garnered a ton of fans since its first outing in 2002. Heck, they just released a new entry in the series just two months before this conference, and both critics and consumers alike just ate it up. 
so I think that people knew that this game, it was in good hands. For a slight bit of history on this game's comeuppance, sometime after Insomniac had finished their Xbox exclusive Sunset Overdrive because for some reason PlayStation waited until like 2019 to finally buy the company. PlayStation came to them and asked if they wanted to make a game on any Marvel property of their choosing. I'm reading this from Wikipedia, by the way. While Ted Price, the CEO of the company, was skeptical at first given how the studio had only worked on original properties, not already existing ones, the rest of the developers were quite on board with it, and even then they were able to keep up their streak of originality since Marvel had agreed to let them come up with their own story and takes on the character, which isn't something they do often. You see, Marvel had a system where they would usually end up making games that tie into movies or something. So this marked a big change to let an outside developer handle their IP and create their own interpretation of it. Another big change would be how it wouldn't end up being published by Activision, who usually was the one to do so for games in the Spider-Man franchise. So while there were going to be plenty of changes that came with this game, Insomniac made sure that it didn't make people feel like it wasn't the same. They got a good team of writers and designers to make Spider-Man fans feel at home, but also give them something fresh, new, exciting. The team worked on the game for four years, showcasing a bit more with every passing year, like some gameplay that people had talked about, something something puddles, some more teasers scattered here and there, a prequel novel and art book, and a very great cinematic trailer a month before its release. Seriously, I love this one. All with the game's tagline, Be Greater. And then, finally, after all this hype and waiting, the game was released on September 7th, 2018. And the community response was just the same as the Ratchet and Clank reboot. Critics and other audience members just ate it up. Good reviews all around, many calling it a true return to form, and some even calling it the best Spider-Man game ever made. Insomniac really hit it out of the park. Not only did it release to critical acclaim, but it also got nominated for Game of the Year, alongside other huge releases like God of War, another huge release from Sony that year. That game did end up winning, but it was still a huge honor for the game to contest with it, along with four other huge games. <coughs> Get robbed, though. <coughs> Later down the line, the game even received some DLC that continued its story, three different comic miniseries that expanded on the game's world, and even its own spin-off, remaster, and a straight-up sequel later down the line. Insomniac's take on the webhead has taken off very quickly. Most everyone is enjoying this new Marvel Spider-Man franchise. It is awesome how much this game series has flourished in only five years. And it all started with a hype train that has been chugging since 2016. Heck, they made an actual hype train for this game. So, given all this excitement surrounding the release of the game, you might be surprised to learn that I... was not around for any of it. Yeah, despite me proclaiming that this is my favorite video game, I wasn't actually part of the hype for this game during the period of reveal to release. Heck, I don't even think I heard of it until well after its release. Like, almost a whole year after. Because at this point in time, I was pretty young. And I was also a heavily biased Nintendo fanboy. Nearly every console I had owned up to that point was from the big N, with the exception of an Xbox 360 I got for my birthday one year. The one time I specifically asked for a new game system that wasn't from Nintendo was for Christmas 2017, where I debated between asking for a PlayStation 4 or an Xbox One, and eventually, I decided on asking for a PlayStation. And on Christmas that year, I got one. I barely used it. I mean, what do you expect? The one game I got with the thing was Star Wars Battlefront 2. And plus, my papa, who is my grandpa, but I always just called him papa, got me Super Mario Odyssey that same year for his gift. Like, what do you want from me? I did end up getting some mileage out of the thing. I mean, it's what I ended up playing Shovel Knight on, and as I already said, 
that ended up becoming one of my favorites. And hey, I even got the PlayStation VR set at one point too. I also barely used it. I got some enjoyment out of the thing, however, even though I used it sparingly, it wasn't long before the system just became dead weight. Until one day in the summer of 2019, I was a middle schooler with nothing to do. Both my friends and parents were busy, so I was just kind of bored with nothing to do but entertain myself. However, I had gained a slight urge to play my PlayStation again. I looked at it, dusty and with missing cords, and that made me feel like maybe I didn't exactly give it the best chance or treatment. Maybe I should give it another shot. So with that, I cleaned it off, found the controllers and cords, and it started back up, good as new. That is when I decided that I should get a new game for the console. Something that isn't a Star Wars sequel. So, I decided to look on Amazon at a bunch of PlayStation 4 games. There were a few I was interested in, but barely any did I feel like wasting the minimal amount of money I had since, again, middle school. But there was one game that caught my attention, and that was, what else, Marvel's Spider-Man. Now, normally, this would have just slipped right past me, but recently, I had become a huge fan of Spider-Man. I had always liked the guy, but I never really got too invested in a series. However, earlier in the year, when both my parents were away on a trip, my grandpa, the one that got me Odyssey, took me to see Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And oh lord, did I love that movie. It single-handedly made me a die-hard fan of the web-slinging, quip-throwing superhero. So, the thought of stepping into his shoes in a video game was dreamlike to me. And also, it was only like 20 bucks at the time, come on, why wouldn't I snack that? So, I got it. Waited a couple of days, and it was here. Admittedly, I had a lot of trouble with a good chunk of the game because my controller's R2 stick was broken and I thought that it was just a problem with the game itself, until the part where you have to shoot the webs to stop the helicopter and that's when I realized that I just needed a new controller. The game felt perfectly fine after that. But yeah, besides that point, I loved the game. I was so invested in the world, the characters, the story, everything couldn't put it down, and even though I didn't know anything about the game going in, that was the fun part. I didn't know anything. It was probably one of the first and only times I went into such a huge game without knowing anything about it, and that was what made it so fun for me. I had no idea who was going to appear, what kind of narrative it would follow, what would happen, it was simply amazing getting to know these characters as if I was meeting new people and watching them go through the plot, and it was just so much fun. This is probably the most I've ever cared about a story and what happens to the characters in it. I genuinely couldn't bear to see these characters go through such bad things. I wanted them to succeed and change. It was just an experience that I will never forget. And I did say that Spider-Verse was what made me a fan of Spider-Man, however, I truly believe that this game was what made me so enthusiastic about him. My obsession for Spider-Verse walked so that my obsession for this could run, basically. I loved this game when I first got it, obviously, but it took a while before I was able to grow such a fondness for it. Every so often, I'd boot it back up and play through the thing again. And I'll tell you, there's only a few games that I actually feel like playing over again. Or, hey, sometimes I'd even turn it on just to do some web slinging and explore around the city. I was really happy I got into this game. But part of me does wish I was part of the hype for this game when it was first announced. But I mean, I was like, nine when it was announced, so that probably wasn't gonna happen anyway. So, that's why I ended up bringing on some people that were there for the hype, and letting them 
tell their first impressions and experiences with the game as a whole. Take the stage, y'all. Um, yeah, if everybody knows me personally, they know exactly my history with this game. Uh, ever since they announced it back in 2016, I was super, super excited for it. Um, couldn't wait, kept begging my, you know, just bugging my parents about it, about like, yo, do you know any more information about this? Daily, before I was even following gaming news heavily at the time. Then in 2017, with us getting the gaming reveal, you know, the gameplay reveal, I mean, and I have how how everything looked just perfect and how everything I wanted it to be, you know, it was just coming together perfectly. And then 2018 with the game releasing, I walked into a GameStop, full Spider-Man suit on, I got the collector's edition, the PS4 bundle. Uh, I was, yeah, I was super, super excited for this. And it was, it was everything I hoped it would be with the, uh, the characters, the dial, you know, the dialogue, the characters, the, the combat, the web swinging, I mean, the villains, the designs, everything was perfect. Perfect. I loved it. And then having somehow go beyond all that in Miles Morales was insane. And I see everything besides story. And, um, you know, with the swing and feel more fluid and freedom, you know, and then having the combat better, the stealth, you can now do uh, wall takedowns, you know, it, it was perfect in every sense of regard, regard, and I'm super excited for Insomniac's sequel for Marvel Spider-Man 2. It's going to be everything I've ever dreamed of ever since I was eight years old as a kid, and uh, yeah, I'm super excited. Thanks, Luke. Glad to be here. To anyone unfamiliar, hi, I'm the Potato King, that self-proclaimed fighting game and RPG nerd that shows up in Luke Carboy's reactions. I've been sent to give my oh-so-important and significant opinion on Spider-Man for the PS4, to help hammer home why you, dear viewer, need to pick this game up and play it ASAP if you haven't already. Being completely honest, my expectations admittedly weren't the highest when Spider-Man was announced. Despite loving Insomniac's repertoire of games, I figured that no Spider-Man game was ever going to top Spider-Man 2 on the PS2, a game that I have such a deep childhood attachment to. To my surprise, though, I was blown away when I finally got my hands on the PS4 game. Even with low expectations, I found myself enamored with just how fun the game was. It's like a complete upgrade from the PS2 game in every sense of the word. Yuri Lowenthal is one of my favorite voice actors and has been since I was a small kid, so hearing his take on Spider-Man left me all giddy and happy. Yuri is such a fantastic Peter Parker, and he delivers Spider-Man's witty quips perfectly. He's probably my favorite take on the character. Swinging around the city feels even better than it did back in the PS2 days, and it made getting things done difficult at times. Not because the missions were boring, no, far from it. I just couldn't stop parkouring and swinging my way around the city, always finding a way to keep up the momentum as I fling myself around. And as if that wasn't good enough, the combat system feels fantastic. As someone that overdoses on combat systems like Kingdom Hearts or Devil May Cries, every combat encounter in Spider-Man felt like a dopamine overdose. The amount of options you have at any moment to keep a combo going is so satisfying, just like those old PS2 games I adore so much. And I feel like that's just it. I've been repeatedly making comparisons to old PS2 games, whether directly related to Spider-Man or not. I don't feel like that's a set of baseless comparisons made just based on what I'm familiar with either. I genuinely feel like Spider-Man PS4 perfectly captures the very essence of old PS2 games. More than anything else, its focus is to deliver a non-stop dopamine rush that leaves the player feeling satisfied. I'm almost always having fun when I play this game, as evident by the platinum trophy I got almost entirely on accident. I don't think I ever had a moment where I wasn't enjoying myself or where I was sifting through some garbage so I could eventually get back to the fun stuff. Just like those old beloved PS2 titles of mine, I could just turn it on and have a blast for hours. It leaves me feeling like a little kid again, and it's such a refreshing feeling in the current gaming landscape. That's just about all I can say without going into excruciating detail about every single thing I love about the game. So I think I'll hand it back to Luke now. Back to you, buddy. Thanks for the input, y'all. It took a while, but after a long time, it just clicked on me that I may have found my game. The one that I constantly gawk over, and want to consume every last detail of. I've claimed multiple different games as my favorite before, but this is the first time where saying it just feels right. 
every other game I'd say that about was either just because I was feeling nostalgic for it at the time, or just because I felt like it was the case. Who knows, maybe someday I'll find a game to surpass this one. Probably on the date of October 20th, 2023, I'm guessing, but we'll just have to see about that, won't we? However, as of now, this is my favorite game of all time. And I think it's time that we get into why that's the case. Starting with... Whenever my dad will peep into my room and I'm playing a modern game such as Tears of the Kingdom or Spider-Man, obviously, something he always says is, wow, this looks nothing like how they used to make them back in the day. And yes, that is kind of a cliche thing to say, but it's true. Imagine how far games have come. When my dad was my age, the most impressive graphics at the time were that of the SNES and Sega Genesis. And that's not to demerit those games. But it's crazy that in such a seemingly short amount of time, games can now have realistic looking landscapes, whole orchestras, and so much more. I get why my dad is so flabbergasted by it. Because seriously, just look at this game, like, actually. Just to say it in simple terms, this game is beautiful. Whether you're slinging through a sunny day where everything is bright and full of life, an evening sun with a beautiful orange sky and calm atmosphere, or at nighttime where the darkness of the sky is contrasted by the bright lights of the city. I've said this before, but I really love colorful cities at night, so I'm a huge fan of this. They're so beautiful. And hey, Insomniac even added rainy weather to the game. It shows up twice in the main story, but rainy environments are another aesthetic that I like and the stratus clouds covering the sky while it pours down is tense, but relaxing at the same time. Just makes you want to sit down and chill. Which, unfortunately, Peter has no time to do. I wish you could change the weather back to rain once the game ends and you get the ability to change it, but it's still nice that it's here. Because I heard it was added because of fan clamor, and it's nice that they did that. Another thing that looks beautiful are the characters themselves. Even the random humans and animals look pretty good, but the main and focused on characters all look amazing. Especially... Alright, yeah, let's... Let's talk about this for a minute. So, what do I think of Peter's new face that he got in the remastered version? Okay, so I did first play the game with the original face. But while I do have to admit I wasn't exactly a fan of it when it was announced, I have warmed up to it. People are pointing out that the animations for the face look really awkward, but you do have to remember that this model was not made for this game's animations. We can already see in Spider-Man 2 and even a bit of Miles Morales that it looks a whole lot better. I'm just glad that it was not first changed for the upcoming sequel. I guarantee people would be even more livid. So I'm thankful that they changed it for the remaster to let people get used to it. Also, the new face just reminds me of Peter's look in Spectacular Spider-Man and I'm willing to accept it for that very reason. Man, I really wish that show was able to get an actual ending. Oh, and its suit better be an option in Spider-Man 2, please I'm begging you. Now for all the other character models, they all looked great in the PS4 game and they somehow look even better in the remaster. All the models are so expressive in cutscenes, and that's pretty impressive. Considering how it's not a cartoonish style where expressions are their forte and character designs are exaggerated and goofy. These designs are made to look similar to that of real humans, with some obvious exceptions. And hey, even he looks kind of realistic and believable, despite being the exact opposite of that. Speaking of Rhino, let's talk about the rest of the villains' designs. I know some people aren't huge fans because they all look like they have the same tailor, and I do have to agree on that to an extent. And the techno aspect of them is something I'm into, but I'm also glad that they're going for a more monstrous aesthetic for the villains in the sequel. But I mean, you still have to admit that they look awesome. I do enjoy the more goofy designs they're known for, However, I just think these designs work for the game's tone and atmosphere. It just makes them look cool, really. 
come on, admit it, they wouldn't be half as threatening as they are in this game if Electro had that sparky lightning mask, or if Rhino was a grey colored overlay with a white horn. They were able to make that work in Spectacular Spider-Man, yes, but again, that art style is still cartoonish in tone. Here, where things are realistic looking, making them have more intimidating features and looks just makes them feel more real and believable in my opinion. They aren't just robbing banks or tying damsels to train tracks while boasting a triangle-shaped chin and a twiddly mustache. They feel... real. Like what a genuine supervillain would do if they were given powers. It works so well for the tone and atmosphere in the story. I'm not saying that realism is inherently better because it's not. The tone and atmosphere of something is not something that is an objective thing. The amount of variety we can get with them, each having their own feel, is incredible. And this game absolutely nailing that tone and atmosphere for its world is something you just have to appreciate. The game's story, which I will touch on later, focuses on what a superhero's life would really be like, the dangers that come with the battle and protecting others, and the troubles that they put themselves and their loved ones in just by being a super. This game's presentation in all departments makes it come to life so well, just from the characters simply existing, or the sprawling and bustling city landscape you freely zip around. You know, it's cliche, and I really hate saying this about this game, but it's really hard to find another way to say it. This game really does make you feel like Spider-Man. And there are so many more ways it accomplishes this goal past this section. Simply the way Peter will flip off buildings into a headfirst dive is just full of the exaggerated financial instability of a white young adult. I'll speak of that more once we actually talk about gameplay mechanics. As for now though, in summary, this game is just a visual treat, with the extremely smooth animations and transitions that just look plain incredible, you legit cannot tell what is a pre-rendered cutscene or not. It all flows together so seamlessly. Insomniac has this thing that happens in the game where a cutscene will start at one area you triggered it, and then transition to over where it takes place. Even just an animated Peter swinging before suddenly getting into gameplay is so satisfying. Like in the opening where the tutorial pops up without a noticeable cut to it. That's something this game is very good at. You could be watching Spider-Man do some out of this world trick in a quick animatic and then instantly swap on over to being in full control. It's really amazing. The motion capture is really well done, you can feel every emotion on every character, even when it's partially or fully covered by a mask, and that's mostly thanks to their voice acting. Most, if not everyone, did a fantastic job. This game is definitive proof in my opinion that AI cannot imitate real art. It took real people to have the line deliveries be packed full of this much emotion. It took real people years to reconstruct New York in order to fit it in this game's world, and so much more. Seriously though, AI and media that is intended to make a profit is really lame, and if you're using it for fun, then who cares? Honestly, go wild. You're not hurting anyone's job or anything. It's fine by my book. Now, then that leads us into the music. People always say that this game's OST is bad, and I've always seen that as a Breath of the Wild situation. This game's music is so atmospheric. It could be silent with the loud noise of chatter and traffic in one moment, but once you start web-slinging, then this heroic and triumphant theme starts playing in the background. Or during a boss fight where it starts upping the intensity and adding new light motifs and such into the mix. The score helps add so much to this game's ambiance and aura. However, you just gotta admit, it's not the type of music that you would actively listen to on its own. That's why some aren't a huge fan. Personally though, I don't think it detracts from the music at all. Like, sure, I like catchy music, but I'd much prefer to have something that fits the game's goal or purpose rather than it just being good for the sake of being good. 
And even then, there's still plenty of tracks I find myself listening to every once in a while. Like the main theme, some boss themes, especially the final boss one. I can listen to that whenever. Also, this game has a live by the Warbly Jets at the very beginning of its soundtrack, and that's a huge banger, so checkmate. Really, it's just the little things that give this game so much of its charm. Whether it be that Peter will sometimes grab a quick bite to eat while waiting on something, or simply him interacting with others in the subway during fast travel. Seriously though, I love those little cutscenes. They show stuff like Peter just hanging out on his phone, but also stuff like talking with a cosplaying fan, or letting a guy sleep on his shoulder. It's these type of things that, oddly enough, are the reason I love Spider-Man so much, as well as other heroes like Superman and The Flash, for example. Not only are they good-hearted, but they're a part of the community. They take time out of their days saving lives to just simply hang out with people that make up the city they protect. It makes them feel more grounded and local, and relatable too. I mean, sure, super ultra-powerful and non-social heroes can be cool, but really, who do you feel like is more relatable? Thor, the god of thunder and prince of Asgard? Or Peter Parker, a simple guy trying to live his life while dealing with relationship and financial problems, all on top of being a part-time superhero? There's barely any superheroes like this that can truly remind me that there's a guy under the mask. A guy who just wants to see the city and people that he loves be safe and sound. That's why I fell in love with Spider-Man. Not his powers or anything like that, his character. In short, they presented this game very, very flawlessly. They hit all the beats that I feel like they wanted to hit, and every single area feels fully developed and realized. So fine-tuned for this game. So yeah, they did a really good job when it comes to visual, musical, or any other type of department that this game needed to have fulfilled. Great work. I cannot think of a good transition, so on to the next section. So this was supposed to be the transition from presentation to gameplay, but obviously that's not gonna happen. So now I'm doing a transition from whatever to story. And let me just say that the story, it's the true reason why I love this game so much. Like I said before, gameplay, tra the traversal, the combat, the side content, it's all super fun, but never before have I just experienced a story like this. It's, I just need to explain to you why it's so, so good. Please, check it out. Now, this game's story is something else. It isn't just the plot or whatever that makes me love it, but how said plot is presented, how much emotional weight each individual action carries, how it can make you smile with a light-hearted bit of comedic value, and then strike you down with a wave of sadness and distraught the next. I want to plug this video right here, a video by High Top Films about how this game is the perfect Spider-Man movie. Yes, it is a video game, you're right, but when you're experiencing this game's narrative, you honestly forget that you're playing a game, that you are the one playing through this story. I normally don't get too emotional over pieces of fictional media, only a few have ever made me genuinely tear up. It has faults for sure. However, this is the piece of the game that I feel Insomniac straight up perfected. They spent so much time making sure that you understand each character's motives and that you love them or love to hate them, and sometimes hate to hate them. There's quite a bit I have to say here. So, how about we just get going through each moment in the main story. 
and talking about the elements that made it so endearing, fun, heartbreaking, and special. And why it's one of the best Spider-Man stories ever told. Surpassing many stories in general, I have experienced throughout my lifetime. Here is the journey of Insomniac's Spider-Man. We open up with a long shot of Peter's room, and already do we have our first spectacular moment of storytelling. From a first glance, this is just a bunch of things in Peter's really messy room. However, when you look closer, it tells you every single thing you need to know about Peter in this timeline. You see, usually most Spider-Man things begin with Peter failing to use his uncle's reboot card. And while it is emotional all the... most of the time, everyone agrees that it... it's getting a little old. Which is why Insomniac decided to opt out on that and began the game's story a whole eight years into Peter's career as Spider-Man. No sudden changes due to the spider bite, no high school, no Flash Thompson, no Mary Jane being the girl next door, no learning how to use his powers, none of that. Peter has been in the game for so many years now. He's experienced, not stricken with grief or guilt, not trying to figure out what Spider-Man means, he already knows. And now we can focus on what being Spider-Man does to Peter Parker, how his life is affected by his choices. He's poor but sustained. His apartment is cluttered but cluttered with things dear to him and his double life. He has a bunch of reminders and articles of all the things he needs to do and has done. And a lot more. There is a lot you can unpack in this single scene. It's a great way to introduce Peter to this world, and immediately after, Peter gets up to a crime alert of a raid on Fisk Tower, prompting him to start getting ready quick as a live by Warbly Jets kicks in. And man, what a perfect song to start off with. The lyrics are uplifting and upbeat, they give a sense of living on the edge and flying over the crowd, and as the tension builds while Peter is getting ready in his room, quieting down when he dons the mask for the first time we see, and then, right before it exudes back up, the rent Peter has been ignoring is slipped through the door, and he has to decide between going after Fisk or sorting that out. And after a quick moment of thinking, the music goes right back up to full drive as Pete runs and jumps out his window, parkouring his way across the buildings without any sort of trouble telling us one very important thing that we need to know. No matter what he does or says, no matter how much he goes through or how hard it is, Peter loves being Spider-Man. After arriving at Fisk Tower following a minor inconvenience, we meet up with Yuri Watanabe, a captain of the New York Police Department and Spider-Man's one and only police contact. Yuri in this game is amazing. She has the right amount of banter with Spider-Man, while also making sure the two genuinely care for each other's well-being. And while Peter does annoy her at times, it's obvious that she trusts him and will come to him for situations she sees fit. I really love the two's dynamic. Oh, and also Peter and Yuri's voice actors for the game, Yuri Lowenthal and Tara Platt respectively, are married in real life. That's just adorable. Maybe that's the reason I love their dynamic so much. After going in... quietly, we make our way up Fisk Tower, stop the big man from deleting his search history, get betrayed by the bomb squad, so you guys were in bed with Fisk all along? Oh no, I'll never get that image out of my head! And finally make our way up to Fisk himself where we get an introductory little boss battle as Fisk says that he'll finally end this after dealing with the same insolence for eight years at this point. Fisk is sort of like a slightly amped up brute here, but this battle was all we needed in order to have us introduced to one of Peter's greatest adversaries. Then near when both are ready to finish the fight, we get one final sequence of 
quick time events. Don't worry, you can turn them off if you want. But after a hard-fought battle, Peter emerges victorious. He webs up Fisk, and with him finally being surrounded by police with no way out, he's arrested, putting an end to his reign over New York. So, should we kiss now? Yeah, maybe later. One of Spidey's most potent villains getting slammed in lockup. And hey, most of the baddies Peter has fought have been sent to jail. So, you may be asking the question, now what? Most of Spider-Man's greatest rivals aren't a problem, and he just put the last one remaining in the slammer. Where's the story left to go? Well, before Fisk got in the car, he mentioned something about how everyone will wish he was back in only a month. So, maybe that has something to do with it. But Peter doesn't really have time to worry about that. He has to get to his actual job. And when we get there, we meet up with Dr. Octavius. Yeah. I think most of y'all know what ends up happening to him, even if you haven't played this game or don't know its story. So, how did Insomniac handle his character? Well, that is a point that High Top made in that video I mentioned. Insomniac made it so you don't want that to happen to him. He's so kind to Peter. You learn so much about the two's history together. Peter constantly talks about his admiration for the man, how he's going to heal the world itself. He always sticks up for Peter, and he is a man that just wants to create something noteworthy and be recognized as such. I loved his betrayal. But as of now, Peter missed the pre-check due to the happenings with Fisk, causing a blowout and this little bummer from the grant committee to barge in and tell you off, prompting Octavius to give you the rest of the day off while he deals with it. Well, not before you do some lab puzzles. I don't believe I've mentioned these yet, but they're, they're okay. Just little brain thinkers that get your mind working. You can turn them off if you want. Really, my favorite thing about this lab is how detailed it is. There are so many things for you to interact and find. You can walk around the lab and find so much stuff about the things they've done, and Pete and Otto's relationship that's treated more as a father and son type than a Boston employee one. The same kind of stuff goes for the Feast Center, which we unlock not too long after. Being Spider-Man is cool and all, but just regular old Peter is a very important part of this game. And during these mundane things like catching up with the homeless who know you by name and love you, or cleaning up little spills just for the heck of it, make the character a whole lot more relatable. Anyways, now that you finally get out of Doc's hair, or uh, head, you get a call from Yuri asking you to come see her at the police station. So, why'd you call? Need a date to the policeman's ball? You got a black and white suit? Uh... This is when you get introduced to crime towers, as well as crimes themselves, and backpacks too. Hey fellas! Ah! A nice little fun introduction to some of the more open world stuff you can do in this game. We even get our first mention of the greatest character in the game. What? No, 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 you promised you wouldn't do that any- Spider cop. Please no. Once Peter is finished with that, he remarks about his three chest hairs being visible through his damaged suit, and yeah, he actually does have three chest hairs with his undies suit, bravo for that. And since it seems like Doc is out for the day, Peter heads back to the lab in order to fix his suit up. But while you're there, Otto comes back into the lab and sees Peter working on his suit. But instead of thinking Pete is Spider-Man, he jumps to the conclusion that he simply creates tech and equipment for the webhead. And hey, it makes sense given that Otto knows Peter is a reliable and smart inventor. And it's nice that even though Otto just thinks he's the equipment designer, he still vows to keep Peter's secret safe. A W man right here. And hey, he even gives you some new ideas for this new and improved suit allowing you to craft up Peter's very own new original suit for this very game, the Advanced Suit. 
and boy is it beautiful. Especially with the cutscene that happens right after, with Spider-Man swinging through the city, dragging his fingers across the ground and slipping on sideways pipes. This whole animation is amazing and something that I really want to recreate in-game. Maybe someday. Maybe. After we get introduced to Fisk hideouts and landmarks, we get called up by Martin Lee to visit Feast and help surprise Aunt May with a party. First, introducing Martin Lee, he's a cool character. He's the founder of the Feast organization, a non-profit charity that houses the homeless and prepares them to re-enter society as a more stable citizen. He's a nice man, just doing his best for the community around him. And you can tell that he really does care about the small actions of people. Even though he's the boss of her, he still looks up to Aunt May and her own motto. When you help someone, you help everyone. And speaking of Aunt May, man, she's just the greatest. Honestly, might be my favorite character in the game. And that is really saying something. Like, saying a lot. Aunt May is just an angel. She works so hard at Feast, while also doing her best to be a good maternal figure to Peter. As he says himself, he can't put into words how much he appreciates her for being so strong and taking care of him after the loss of both his parents and Uncle Ben. It actually took a while to realize, but looking at her character and even her looks, she really resembles my late grandmother, whom I called Meemaw. Like, a lot. Like, it's actually insane how similar they are. This is the reason I appreciate Aunt May so much. It feels like she serves as a sort of testament to her. And I have more to say, but we'll talk later. Now, let's just leave it at saying that Aunt May is just the sweetest thing in this game. And also, she's pretty funny too. I still wish you and MJ could work things out. She's a great girl. She is, but... The two of you would make some beautiful wow. baby. After thanking Lee for setting up the party, we get a call from Yuri about a break-in at a Fisk auction sale. And when Pete arrives, he finds these masked criminals taking the woman running the auction sale hostage. And he also finds someone else. Or actually, they find him. Hey, Pete. MJ? Yeah, for some background, MJ and Peter aren't dating in this world. Well, not anymore at least. Some time ago, the two split up and now the meeting of awkward exes commences. Despite this being the two's first meeting since they broke up, they quickly grow comfortable with each other and treat each other like lifelong friends. MJ tells Pete about how she got in the situation due to her trying to get a story when she wasn't supposed to, and while investigating a mysterious statue she saw in a room and finding a file with the name Devil's Breath written upon it, the masked men had barged in, prompting her to go and hide. After Peter takes care of the mess, he invites MJ to dinner. During their... not date, they talk about things they've been up to, their current happenings, and their relationship. MJ asks Peter if he remembers the reason they broke up, and before Peter has the chance to answer the question wrong, he is safe by the siren when the police pass through. And before MJ decides to take her leave, we get a cameo from the man himself, Stanley. And this was actually one of his final cameos that he ever took place in, given he died about two months after the game's release. We miss you, Mr. Lee. Now, as Spider-Man catches up with the police, he meets up with one of his old pals, with heavy quotation marks, Herman Schultz, aka Shocker. However, during the chase that follows their meeting, Spidey notices that he seems different than usual. He isn't just stealing money because of greed, he seems desperate. Like, he needs the money, or else he's in serious danger. 
Pete considers the idea that he may be working with or for someone, and that someone doesn't like it when things aren't done right. When Peter finally catches up though, it doesn't seem like he feels like talking. So Pete just decides to ask about design details later. With that taken care of and Herman being sent back to lockup, Peter decides to ask Martin Lee about the mask he found at the break-in. And after a quick snack, and maybe possibly getting back on talking terms with MJ, he enters Feast once again to ask Lee about what he can tell him about the mask given that he has a degree in historic art. And this might be the first time I actually get to use it. But when Peter takes it out, he seems spooked by it, saying that the Mandarin on the back of the mask translates to the word demon. He tells Parker that it is most likely linked to something or someone dangerous. Something that he and MJ shouldn't be messing with. Once he tells MJ about it and leaves, Peter heads back to the lab just in time for a fitting with a test subject. And despite the slight failure of the last attempt, this time, it goes well. The arm actually works as intended. But not too long after, a bunch of people barge in and start taking equipment. Valuable and sensitive equipment. Due to Otto's past failures, he isn't seen as fit for the grant money he's been working off of for so long. And this leads into the dismay of Otto finding out that his funding was cut short by Norman Osborne, the mayor of New York City, and just to say, as described by Cadicarus, Not a single person yeah. likes him. And, yeah, fair. He is not the most likable person on the planet. He steals away their test subject and hard work, and gloatfully offers him more advanced tech for his arm. Heck, he even tells Peter that when Harry <laughs> returns from Europe, that the two can start their own business together. You kinda get the feeling that Norman here is just out to get Otto. And that makes you really envy Osborne in the scene. And when he takes his leave, Otto tells Pete that he can't pay him anymore without the grant money, and suggests to him that he starts looking for a new job. After looking into one of Harry's research stations for ways to fix things up, Spidey gets a call from Yuri telling him that Shocker has escaped, or my bad has been let out of prison, by a guy that seemed to be in a trance with glowing eyes. Yikes. Spider-Man meets up with Ole Schultz while he's robbing a bank, and after Pete's failed attempt at the big hit game face punch, Shocker takes his turn. The two have a small little scuffle in the bank, destroying the place while doing so. After a while of back and forth thing between the two skill sets, Spider-Man is finally able to put Herman in a position where he can't get himself out. However, even now, the entire battle, Peter still notices how desperate he seems. Like obviously someone robbing a bank and stealing money is desperate, but Shocker, he seems scarily desperate. He confirms he is working for someone, but he can't tell who, because, well, if I talk, I'm dead. They made that very clear. yeah, this is where things start to get real. So what is going on then? Remember how Fisk said we would want him back soon enough? So you see, Fisk, he's a bad guy, obviously. But he loved New York, like genuinely. And now that he's gone, as said by Jonah, everyone with a big enough ego is gonna want the title as the next mob boss. And that fight for control isn't gonna happen quietly. There's a possible gang war in sight. And it's very possible that the side that wins is one that only wants the worst for the city. Once Yuri informs Spider-Man that Shocker is being sent to prison again, she tells him to investigate one of Fisk's properties, which these demons have been attacking as of late. And to help him out, Yuri sends one of her best men to investigate, Officer Jefferson Davis. 
and man, I really like his character. And the thing is, there ain't much about him. He cracks a joke every once in a while and talks about his family, but really, he just acts as a genuine ally to Spider-Man. The two talk as lifelong friends even though they just met. It feels official, yet comfortable. I like this guy. Once the two get in the warehouse on the port, they look around for secret entrances and eventually find one under the floor. Unfortunately, what they found being a weapons vault had already been found by the demons, so that prompts the two to get into a fight with them, eventually leading Spider-Man to chasing after a runaway truck full of demons. And when he catches up and saves an unaffiliated trucker from a miraculously on time 3, he pulls the truck back up to safety, and then... Oh dear. Oh. Well, that worked out. I really love this scene. The way Peter braces for impact only for Davis to suddenly swoop in and hit the truck out of the way, and heck, when the demon comes out limping trying to shoot Spider-Man, Davis quickly gets up and knocks him down before collapsing on the road. Man, I know it's odd for me to really like this scene specifically, but man, do I just adore it. Spider-Man is a hero, but not all heroes have to be super. Maybe the reason Jefferson is a hero is because he's just a guy that doesn't give up. While hurt from the impact, he's still kicking, only suffering minor injuries. MJ is able to convince him to let her write a story on his heroism, and the night takes a turn for the better. Although, not necessarily for everyone. Because, since the Fisk takedown, Peter hasn't been home. So, it would be nice for him to go home and relax with his nice, safe, belong- Oh. Right. Man, the guys who cleaned out this room must have had a field trip with all the Spidey stuff they found. Yeah. Remember that rent due letter Peter received at the very beginning of the game? Him ignoring that caught up to him. And now, he has nowhere to stay. And worse yet, his Spidey drive, containing most of the spider-related stuff he's worked on since high school, is also gone. So, he might want to get that back. After some help from Eddie, the guy from Sanitation, thanks Eddie, we get to the location where Pete's trash was, stop the thugs harassing the worker, and find the Spidey drive in a trash stack. After finding it, Spidey finds an old prototype of the web bomb which he never finished, and decides to go back and finalize the design. Then, after that debacle, comes the second problem on Pete's hands. Finding out where he's gonna sleep. He decides to try MJ's house, and just gives himself the worst pep talk. Hey MJ, now that we're talking again, I thought maybe- oh, Okay, that just sounds pathetic! After finding out she's busy with her story though, he decides to just let her be. Luckily, sweet Angel May comes to the rescue and lets him sleep on the couch in her office at Feast. And look, she even gives him a little money to hold him off until he can start earning money again. Like I said, the sweetest thing. However, Martin Lee comes in and tells May that he'll be gone for a while, and asks her to take care of the place while he's gone, given that it represents the best part of him. Okay, buddy. Have fun at that personal business that you've been planning for a while. Once Peter takes his leave, he gets a call from MJ about there being an award ceremony for Officer Davis that day, as well as an Osborne rally at the same place and time, because politicians. The two plan to meet up there, but before the ceremony begins, Pete gets a call from Davis asking him to investigate a Fisk construction site that may be linked to the gang war going on between the two aforementioned crime boss's men and the demons. Spidey arrives, sees a suspicious looking truck with the words consolidated shipping driving away from the site that catches his eye, and finds that all of Fisk's men have been compromised by the demons. After taking care of them, he takes the phone of one worker who was on call with Fisk himself, who asks him to keep his men alive and he'll tell him the location of the demon's leader. After taking care of some new baddies and saving even more criminals in trouble, 
Fisk tells us to go to the roof, where we find who is supposedly the head honcho of this ordeal. Before Pete can get to them, however, the helicopter is able to sever the connection between Pete's webs and the copter, causing what webs that stayed attached to take hold of a generator and create a helicopter wrecking ball of doom. A wreck -a copter And what follows this part is probably one of the coolest, if not the coolest, action sequences in this whole game. This section of the game was heavily advertised in the marketing, as it was the point of the gameplay showcase, and also seemingly the location of where that cinematic trailer took place. And boy did they pick the right section. Because almost immediately, things start getting absurd. The Rekicopter, I should really get that patented, knocks a crane over, and while Peter is trying to stop it, the hook of it ends up swinging at just the wrong place and absolutely sends Peter falling off the building, knocking him unconscious for a few moments before he quickly snaps back and quickly webs the crane to some nearby buildings so that he can take on the remaining runaway demons. Not even Pete believed that just happened. Oh, and during this chase, we also have some of the best moments of banter between Yuri and Peter. That helicopter is destroying the city. I know. You need to bring it down. I know. Maybe you could superhero a little faster? Working on it, Yuri. Call you when it's done. Chase leads to Peter parkouring his way through an office floor, outrunning the unattached generator Indiana Jones style, and Spidey having to tear off the helicopter's engine plates by hand while in the section that really confused me for some reason the first time I played it. After that, we have easily my favorite part, where Peter, having to think of a plan really fast, webs the helicopter to some nearby buildings, creating a sort of pendulum, making him use all of his strength to pull the helicopter just slightly up so that it doesn't hurt anyone below. Even the tail ends up getting scraped up, and Peter has to perfectly time and aim his shot in order to web it up to a wall and save a crowd of civilians. And finally, after all that commotion, Spidey leaps up, prays that he doesn't mess it up, and webs the helicopter to a giant... well, web, before finally posing in style with the danger finally gone. Man, what a cool scene! It is easily the one I start thinking about the most when it comes to this game's action sequences. It is both very fun to play through and a blast to see unfold. Once Spidey swings away after suggesting that Yuri bring a ladder to the scene, we get our introduction to... My freaking boy! Dude, I was so excited when Miles showed up, man. I know it was expected given that Jefferson Davis is literally his dad, but I was still really ecstatic when he showed up. Like I said way earlier, Spider-Verse made me fall in love with the character, and I love both portrayals of the character pretty much equally. They both do him so much justice. Anyways, Peter finally makes it to the rally, where he meets up with MJ. They talk about the gang war for a bit, and aside from a few loose ends, such as the consolidated shipping truck I mentioned earlier, things might be calming down a bit. Osborne does his speech thingy, gets interrupted with a phone call that seems urgent, and Davis gives a speech, thanking his son and wife for always being there for him. And... Actually, you know what? Things are going smoothly here, and award ceremonies are really boring anyway. So, how about I just go ahead and skip this cutscene? Oh. Um. Let's rewind a bit. So, okay, remember that phone call I said Norman got? Well, it wasn't just some scammer or wrong number. It was a threat. However, this guy calling didn't want money or data or anything. He wanted... To watch you suffer. Yeah, that. And after Norman hears this and... dips, Peter's spider sense starts tingling and before he can do anything, bombs start to go off all around the place, leaving the whole crowd in serious danger 
as the once sunny sky turns to gray smoke, and the happy and calm atmosphere is filled with fire and explosions. And right before Peter and Miles were knocked unconscious, we saw Davis use his own body to shield others from a corrupted suicide bomber that he was right next to. So who knows if he's alive or not? Well, we finally get to play as Miles in this pretty short self section, and after he saves his mom and makes it towards the main stage, he tries to fight off one of the demons himself, but it doesn't really go well. And it looks like it might be the end for him before a mysterious voice calls out saying enough we have to leave now look i know it was obvious from the trailers and stuff but as someone not knowing what to expect from this game my jaw was on the floor when i found out that martin lee was behind all this, that he was the leader of the demons. It's hard to say if Insomniac wanted to be secretive about it, but it still fooled me. Once you already know his intent, playing the game again allows you to see so many context clues that led to this moment. It's so genius. I was in such disbelief from this reveal. I couldn't believe that Martin Lee of all people had done something like this. But we'll talk more on that later. Really, my disbelief just grew more when Miles found out that his dad did end up dying from the blast, going out suddenly, but as a hero. And Miles has no words, just looking up with tears in his eyes after confirming that what was happening wasn't some nightmare. It had happened and there was nothing he could do. What a gut puncher this entire sequence was. We just got back from making jokes with Pete while beating up no-name crooks, only for this moment of hopefulness to be interrupted by these fear-mongering terrorists in the most destructive way. I have no words. And get this, this is just the end of Act 1, with three acts in total and it only gets crazier from here. Before we can get back to spider Manning, we attend Jeff's funeral a week after the terrorist attack on City Hall, where Peter tries to have a chat with Miles, but he isn't really taking the happenings too well. He's in a state of grievance and with barely anyone besides his mom to turn to, who is mourning the loss of her husband just as much as he is mourning the loss of his father. Peter wants to help, but he doesn't know how. The only thing he feels he can do is find Martin Lee. So he starts looking for clues immediately and keeps Yuri in check to make sure he is taken care of as soon as possible. He looks around some demon hideouts with the help of MJ, before at one of the locations, his search is interrupted by a group known as Sable, an international military for hire that had just been employed by Osborne, all led by one Silver Sablanova, better known as Silver Sable. Nice entrance, solid eight out of ten. Nine out of ten. Before Sable can do anything highly illegal, we're saved by Yuri arriving with her police force. Though Sable lets Peter go, she makes it clear that the two aren't really on good terms, and Peter takes his leave before things get worse. Not wanting to halt his search for Martin though, he decides to take the search to Feast, and on the way there, he gets a call from MJ about what to do with Miles, and after a bit of talking, they decide that the best thing for him would be to start volunteering at Feast. He finds May, tells her about Miles, cleans up some messes to help her, totally discreetly uses his powers to get inside Lee's office and finds a whole bunch of stuff relating to Lee's plans, like how he wants nothing more than to see Osborne face the justice he deserves. Again, like Caddy says, Not a single person yeah. likes him. But something else he says does catch your attention. 
about how he partly regrets doing this because of how he'll be giving up Feast in the process, saying that the place and organization is a genuine part of him, something to help feed his kinder, more hospitable side. However, he says that his mad and monstrous form needs to be fed too, and he just can't wait any longer to take revenge. Peter finds some more evidence around the office, including how he immediately jumped at the chance the second news broke out that there was a vacuum for the new mob boss when Fisk was arrested, meaning he could seize his inventory and data, all collected into a secret room filled with files and proof of his intentions. We even find the stolen file MJ found earlier on Devil's Breath, seemingly planning on using it against Osborne, and even a trap floor which almost electrocutes Peter to a crisp. When Peter finds his way out, he is greeted by guess who, who tells him and May both that they should, and I quote, stay out of places they're not supposed to be before leaving for another, again, and I quote, personal business. And before Peter can chase after him, he corrupts some innocent homeless people to start attacking Pete, which of course isn't too much of a problem, but it does slow him down, allowing Martin to get away. Peter calls Yuri and tells her to come investigate Martin's office, then makes plans with MJ to talk over these things during dinner. However, while waiting for her to say she's ready for him to come over, he gets an urgent call from Otto, saying that he needs to come over to the lab now, as he may have had a breakthrough. When Peter gets there, he sees Otto getting ready to test another prosthetic, really enthusiastic about it. However, things don't go exactly as planned, and the test fails, leaving Otto angered and cussing out Norman saying that he's the reason he's such a failure. And I haven't mentioned this yet, but William Salyers as Octavius is such an incredible performance. He's genuinely tied with Yuri as Spider-Man for my favorite voice performance in this game. Damn it! This is all your fault, Norman, you son of a- No matter what type of line he's doing, he always sells it no matter what. I am so happy with it. I have more moments like this to mention later, but for now, I'm just gonna say that William and Yuri as their respective characters are very, very excellent. And all the other VAs too, I'm not gonna forget about them. Otto explains to Peter why the two have so much tension between them, as Otto and Norman were lab partners in college, and even co-founded Oscorp together. But over time, Norman became more obsessed with more genetic-related experiments that Otto considered unethical, and when lawyers started getting involved, that was the final straw for him. He decided to leave Oscorp and start his own lab. While Otto was telling this story, Peter fixed up the prosthetic and got it in working condition again. Once the two have a successful test, and also show us their unbreakable bond, nearly unbreakable bond, Peter finds out that he has a missed call from MJ and then he has to leave. He makes it over to her house for dinner, and when he arrives, MJ tells Peter about what she did earlier in the day, when she visited the address of a place that Peter found while investigating demon hideouts for clues. She tells him about how she found a biker gang hiding out in a shop, meaning that we have to go through yet another stealth section. When MJ gets near the office, she finds out that the place is being run by the one and only Tombstone, who promptly... Such a disappointment. <laughs> lays off one of his employees. MJ finds a tracking device in his office and leaves before Tombstone can catch her in the act, leaving the rest to Spider-Man to find out what he's doing at a later time. However, right now, Peter is finishing up his chicken curry, which according to MJ, is legit. But while waiting, the two have a chat about their relationship and what's next. MJ asks Peter if the two can be partners, to which Peter doesn't know how to respond. But before they can talk more about it, Peter's crime sensor goes off and finds out that the home of Charles Standish, Oscorp CFO, has been broken into. 
so Pete has to quickly take his leave. A bit too quickly. Wait, you don't think this has anything to do with Lee, do you? Sorry to cook and run. Did, did you just leave your clothes on the kitchen floor? Uh... Once Spidey arrives and makes it to the top of the building, he saves Standish from being taken hostage by the demons and finds the next person that he should question on Devil's Breath, being one Dr. Isaac Delaney. But before Spidey can find out anything else, the demons interrupt their meeting and Spider-Man has to save Standish from falling down an elevator shaft. Once out, Standish is immediately taken in by Sable, leaving Peter with Delaney being the only lead he found. A lead? You sound like a cop. Don't you mean... Spider Cop? Uh, Yuri? After MJ looks into Delaney, she finds out that he's a professor at ESU, and is dressed up for a costume party going on there. After a... few roadblocks, he finds Delaney on the dance floor, but he is taken hostage by the demons before he can reach him. After saving some students and making his way towards Delaney, he finds Lee ready to question the doctor. And we finally see Lee turn into Mr. Negative for the first time as he corrupts Delaney, making him tell the name of the lead scientist behind Devil's Breath, being Dr. Morgan Michaels. And then when Lee gets that out of him, he forces them to... Oh. Needing more than just a name, Peter heads over to the Oscorp building and sneaks his way in while avoiding Sable. MJ tells Peter about how Norman and Fisk actually work together in order to build a secret lab for Devil's Breath, but she doesn't know where. So Peter, hoping to find more clues, sneaks into Osborne's office and pulls up a slides presentation on Devil's Breath, where we finally find out what Devil's Breath, codenamed to GR27, is. It was a very secret project that was originally made to cure most, if not all, diseases known to mankind. And I'm talking genetic diseases. Like Pete said, cystic fibrosis, Huntington's, both of those, and many more being on the table for that discussion. However, in its current state, it's a bioweapon and it targets a person's immune system, practically destroying them from the inside out. Finally, Peter finds out that Michaels is the only one with the only sample, which he keeps on him at all times by his side. With this now in mind, Peter tells MJ this, who suggests sneaking into the Sable base that Standish is being held in in order to question his whereabouts. Obviously, Peter doesn't think that's a good idea, but MJ does it anyway because, I don't know, she's a daredevil. Standish thinks that she works for Lee and has her at gunpoint, and right when MJ convinces him that she isn't, Peter drops in and abruptly scares Standish and alerts the Sable guards, leaving the two having to swing out quickly. And when Peter drops her back off at home, she tells him that this is the reason the two broke up in the first place that he would always treat her like a child and wouldn't let her do anything to help. And the thing is, you can see both sides of the argument here. Neither are necessarily in the wrong. MJ doesn't want to feel useless to Peter, and she's tired of not feeling as strong as him. But Peter doesn't want MJ to constantly put herself in danger like that. She's tough, but she can't take a fraction of the punishment that Peter can. He doesn't want to lose her. Both sides have their points. They don't lean heavily in one character's favor. They complement each other's personality so well, and when they fight, it feels like a real argument that a couple would have. I really love the two. Even though MJ is still pissed, she tells Peter about how Sable is moving Dr. Michaels to a more secure location the next day. So, having a bit of time to kill, Peter decides to look for a way to blow off some steam. And luckily, Otto ends up calling him to come in and test a new design. Once Peter gets there and fixes a few things up before testing, Otto puts on the neural interface and begins testing the prosthetic. And this time, it actually works. 
it goes smoothly, there's no breakdowns or setbacks, the arms work as intended, and give Otto his great breakthrough he's been hoping for all these years. He finally did something great. But something seems off about him in the moment, and when Peter questions what's wrong, Otto admits to Peter that the doctors have told him that he has been suffering from what they call a degenerative neurological condition, meaning his body and muscles are becoming more useless by the day. But his brilliant mind is still intact, fully operational, so in no time, he could be just a mind without a working vessel, like some sort of curse. And when Peter digs deeper into the situation in Otto's office, he finds out that he could lose control of all of his motor functions within a year at this rate, and the neural interface may only be making it worse giving the possibility of possibly altering his mind and even personality, producing yet another setback and huge risk for the project that the two will have to watch out for. Once Peter leaves now that his aunt is texting him, he heads to Feast to check on Miles during his first day. But while he's on the way there, he spots Miles himself being mugged. And hey, he even tries to fight back against the thugs. But... He's just a teenager with no combat training or knowledge whatsoever, so he's taken down pretty quick. Luckily, Peter comes down to save him just in the nick of time, and once he's finished with the thugs, Miles, who is a huge fan of Spider-Man by the way, I don't think I've mentioned that, is ecstatic to meet his hero. Shaking his hand very excitedly, not knowing what to say, and not being able to put the smile on his face away. It's just adorable. I love this little interaction a lot. Spidey gives him some advice and tells him to stay out of trouble, but before he can leave, Miles blurts out that he just isn't as incredible as Spider-Man is. That he can't do what he does. So, in response... Spider-Man turns around, tells Miles to put him up, and gives him a quick little lesson on how to fight, even letting him practice by letting himself get socked in the face by Miles. This single scene imbues the reason I love Spider-Man so much. He cares about the people in the city. He not only makes sure they're safe, but he takes time out of his schedule to make sure they feel comfortable around him that he left an impact on their life for the better. And it worked for Miles. He gained a giant confidence boost from this encounter and made him leave with such a great smile. I just punched Spider-Man. I love this scene, man. Once Miles makes it to Feast after avoiding some Sable guards along the way, he meets up with Peter who shows him around. And while awkward at first, he quickly grows accustomed to the people here and begins making some connections. However, things start going south once Miles fixes a TV for this grumpy old man, and it immediately turns to a channel talking about the death of his father. And to make things worse, Ernie, the grumpy old man I just talked about, makes a remark about how the only heroic thing he did was getting blown up. But just when Miles starts to walk away... Peter shows up out of nowhere and tells Ernie that Davis was his father, making the situation resolve a lot better than it would have initially. And after the matter, Miles thanks Peter for the help. Despite being the same exact person, both Spider-Man and Peter helped Miles in two completely different ways. That's a really nice detail. Once Miles gets settled into the kitchen with May, Peter leaves to catch the convoy moving Dr. Michaels. Before Sable can even start the move, however, a giant truck full of demons shows up out of nowhere and destroys the car Michaels was in and kills the guards protecting the package, kidnapping Michaels in the process. Spider-Man arrives, cleans up the mess a little, then chases after the vehicle, fighting while on top of a speeding truck, getting stuck on a door while sledding it across the street, and even crawling on the underside of a truck while trying to get to Lee. Oh, and I also really like the small little cutscene right here that just 
perfectly describes New York in a nutshell. Once Peter gets to Lee, however, he starts to corrupt him and show him his perspective of the situation. Spidey goes through Lee's thoughts, trying to convince him to become one of them and take down Osborn for good. But Spidey refuses and breaks out of the corruption. Unfortunately, not before the truck crashes into a nearby building, leaving the demons time to escape. And thankfully, Dr. Michaels is okay, and mostly unharmed, but without the devil's breath in hand. After another peaceful meeting with Silver Sable, Peter goes to investigate a car that matches one Lee stole that Michaels told him about. When he reaches it though, it's empty, and he can't even warn MJ about it given that she's not picking up her phone when he calls her. We then cut to MJ at Grand Central Station, where an Oscorp invention presentation is taking place, and MJ believes that there, she can find more clues on the situation. While she's looking at one of the inventions being a dispersal device, however, Lee comes up from behind her, begins killing the guards around the place, and forces all the civilians to gather in the middle as the Devil's Breath is placed in the dispersal device. Lee then calls Osborne and tells him to come to the area in 30 minutes by himself, or else he'll be responsible for even more deaths. MJ is able to get a hold of Peter, and he comes as fast as he can to the station. And, like I said before, it's really cool to see him do spider stuff from the perspective of a regular human. MJ saves a man from being shot by saying she is a reporter, which gives Pete a perfect opportunity to swoop in and take care of the guard watching her. And after some bickering, MJ makes her way over to the dispersal device and is able to disarm it, leaving the rest to Peter as he takes care of the demons, allowing the hostages to get away. And when Lee tries to escape on a train, Peter catches up and the two have a quick battle as the speeding train roars across the subway, even switching cars at one point. However, after overloading Lee with too much power, he collapses in defeat and leaves Peter with an even bigger problem, stopping the train. He tries to use an old trick, but... Uh, it totally worked last time! So, he has to go the old-fashioned way, which is a bit more destructive than he would have wanted, but it works. And with that... Lee is sent off to jail, supposedly ending his reign of terror over New York. And after all is said and done, things seem fine for once. There's no twists or extra details that need to be sorted out. It's over. But there's still a bit of trouble with Peter Parker going on, as he still hasn't sorted things out with MJ. He wants to make things work with her, but he doesn't know how. This is all shown in a very real scene of Peter's human and superhuman lives clashing perfectly. There's a lot of scenes that really stick out to me in this game, and I've already mentioned a few, but this scene isn't really sad or really exhilarating. It's just real. Peter is walking up walls and web-slinging, but he's also just having a conversation with MJ about what's next in their relationship. And it's just a really nice scene that I love. I can't really explain it. It just makes you sympathize and relate to Peter Parker more. It's so genius. Needing some time to cool down, Peter heads back to the lab where we see Otto now wielding the arms himself. Peter, not thinking it's a good idea, does some tests and finds out that he was right. It's already starting to affect Otto's mind and change his personality, making him more aggressive and not himself. And I know I said before that his anger highlighted how good a voice actor Salyers is. He's truly really great as regular old Otto Octavius, a calm, simple old gentleman, but when he's angry and mad, he truly shows how good he is. 
It could be affecting other parts of your brain, your, your inhibitions, your mood. I, I just think we need some more tests. We've got enough tests! For the first time in my life, I don't feel like a failure. I feel like me. After some convincing about how they just need to work on it more, Otto apologizes and asks to be alone for a bit. But when Osborne starts speaking on the TV, he reactivates the arms and begins to fuel up his anger again, giving us a clue as to what's about to come next. So when you're casting your vote, remember what I've done. We're all safer now than we have ever been. Liar! You have no idea what you're in for. Peter heads back over to Feast to see how May and Miles are doing after the news came out that Lee was responsible for all the trouble and tragedy caused by the demons, and they're taking it pretty well. They're obviously shaken by the news, but they still press forward because that's what heroes are supposed to do. Miles says it's what his dad would have wanted, and May says that it's part of her Parker pride and willpower that Ben emitted when he was still around that caught onto her. But once things seem all fine and good, things come dropping down fast. When a news report comes on and reveals that the truck the Devil's Breath was in has been ransacked and the Devil's Breath is gone. As Peter says, things might have just gone from bad to catastrophic. He heads over to the site and finds nothing, but Yuri in a helicopter tells him that there are more things to worry about, as there's currently a riot at Rikers, the city's prison. When we get there, prisoners are everywhere, taking out guards, grabbing weapons, and making the entire place a war zone. It takes a while for Peter to take care of them all, but when he does, he has an even bigger problem to tackle. The Raft having a riot of its own. And the Raft is not only a supermax prison, but it's the supermax prison that holds nearly all the supervillains that Spidey has faced in his lifetime. And all of them start breaking out one by one. Electro, Rhino, Scorpion, Vulture, every single one of them escaping, making things more chaotic by the second, leading to a chase that just... Man, look at this. Look how beautiful this is. The effects, the nighttime lights, the explosions, it's so mesmerizing. And there's barely any breathing room too. There are villains left and right causing problems for old Petey. And it all comes down to the meeting on the roof between all the previously mentioned bad guys, plus Martin Lee. And after a bit of failed negotiation, the fighting begins. All the villains rush at Peter all at once. And there's this immaculate sequence of Peter holding all of them off for a little while before finally, one good attack gets to him, and that opening leaves the villains a good chance to absolutely mess Spidey up. Kicking him, stomping on him, the works, all cultivating on one massive final electrocution attack. And the pain doesn't stop there, for when Peter starts to crawl away, He's met with the mastermind of the whole operation. Octavius himself. And without missing a beat, he tells Spider-Man his warning. Stay out of our way. Before throwing him out like trash, leaving Peter unimaginably hurt, both physically and emotionally. The utter disbelief getting to him that the man he admired for all these years, for his kindness, his ambition, his drive to help everyone, has just turned to the side of darkness. 
And with that, Otto sends all the villains out to their assigned tasks, leaving Peter to remain unconscious, miraculously saved by a flotation device, before being found by the police and taken to the hospital. And before Peter can do anything about it, Doc takes the Devil's Breath to Times Square, and releases it amongst the people. And after this moment right here, is when things start going to hell. The Devil's Breath sickness spreads like wildfire, infecting so many people across the city, including Aunt May. And it only gets worse from here. Prisoners have taken over the city, supervillains are rampaging through the streets, and Spider-Man is now labeled as a number one priority target by Sable. Osborne is now lower than ever, but we all know it's not over, and Osborne knows that too. So, with Peter and his 14 broken bones, good god, gets back up and tries to stop what might be the end of the world, or the city at the very least. This is the beginning of Act 3 the final and shortest act with only eight missions in it. Yeah, we're in the end game now. Peter tries his best to calm things down around the city by taking out prisoners and sable guys, and even though he's doing the best he can, it's still too much for him to handle. We've got so many different groups of bad guys hanging around the city, waiting for you to pass by so they can shoot and attack you. However, while Pete's trying to do cleanup, He's told by Yuri that Rhino and Electro are causing problems around the city. Both have taken control of different precincts, and both are causing problems for officers and citizens alike. And to make things worse, while you're taking care of these villains, May calls and tells you that men from Rikers are outside Feast's sister site and are demanding supplies. And even later, MJ calls to tell you that they've set fire to the building, and both May and Miles are trapped inside. Once Peter saves the officers and people, he rushes towards Feast as fast as superhumanly possible and goes straight into the fire, finding both May and Miles right in the middle. And Spidey can't do much because he's already holding onto a platform that would drop the two if he let go. Luckily though, MJ enters through a nearby window and pushes a wooden beam down to make a walkway despite Peter's warnings not to enter the building. May and Miles make it out safely, but Peter falls down into the flames after the floor above him collapses right onto his body. Nearly entirely worn out, he fires one last web to try and save himself, which wouldn't have made it if Miles and MJ weren't there to catch it and pull him up. Once Spidey is safe and sound, he takes a minute to rest with MJ on top of a nearby building, and the two finally reconcile after the fight they had a few nights earlier agreeing to become partners again, and finally regaining each other's trust, promising to let the other use their own strengths to support the other. And when Miles comes back out trying to be as helpful as he can, you gotta love him for it, Spider-Man tells the both of them to keep in touch with him and help keep this city safe before leaving to try and find some more info on Doc Ock. Do you have his number? Are you Spider-Man's girlfriend? That'd be so cool. <laughs> he makes it to Times Square, the release point of Devil's Breath, and after finding his way up a stream of the virus, he finds a small hideout on the top of a building. And here, he finds out that Doc was able to enlist the help of all these villains by giving them something they want. Like Rhino wanting to walk free of his suit, or Scorpion wanting to have a clean record. He even finds that Otto has found weaknesses to Sable Tech, and that he's assigned each villain to a certain Oscorp designation in order to weaken down the company giving Otto the perfect opportunity to expose Norman and fulfill his hatred of the man. But something catches the eye of Peter while looking at this map. Lee's job of finding the anti-serum using something by the name of Icarus. After looking around the lair some more, he finds a box with the same name and opens it up, only to find out there was never a secret weapon or plan called Icarus. It was just a trap to get him into position for the explosives Doc Ock planned for him. Spider-Man is able to escape just in the nick of time, but unfortunately he's greeted by Vulture who is there just in case the trap failed. 
He is then dragged across the city, parkouring over cars and getting banged into buildings before finally being dropped off at the power plant, where he's greeted by Electro as well. And this begins a double team boss fight between Bulcher and Electro. And while we haven't gotten to the final boss yet, while I do prefer that one for reasons rather than a gameplay perspective, this is probably my favorite boss fight in the game. Like I said, I'll get into why I still personally like the final boss more when we get there, but this fight is so much fun. Not only do we have to deal with two villains rather than one, both with completely different power sets, but it's also exclusively in the air, meaning you'll be swinging around the area constantly dodging lightning bolts and avoiding Vulture's dive bombs. It can get really intense. You have to be really attentive in this fight, and with the climatic music in the background and the nighttime aesthetic, it's pretty climatic. Oh, and both Vulture and Electro have some pretty good banter with Spider-Man as well. No, Adrian! It's me, Spider-Man! Spider-Man! I must break you! You got it! You got my joke! Once Spidey beats both of the villains, though, and leaves them to be apprehended, he picks up one of their phones which on the line has Doc, who explains that if Spider-Man really did care about the city, he would just let him do his thing, and let Norman face the justice he truly deserves, before hanging up and Spider-Man is still left with nothing. Exhausted from the past, however many hours, Peter swings onto a nearby rooftop and lays down for a while while falling asleep, and not waking up until the next morning, finally giving him some beauty rest before going right back into saving the city. Spider-Man heads to Central Park's reservoir since he knows that Scorpion was tasked with the area to presumably poison the city's water, and according to Peter, the city may never recover if they lose access to clean water. Once he arrives, however, he finds out that it was only a setup to get him to come there, and that Scorpion was merely there to surprise attack him, injecting him with poison. And after Scorpion leaves, Peter starts hallucinating the entire city being flooded by poison, with giant scorpion tails to boot. And while Yuri's voice acting can be... less than ideal at points, My brain will create nightmares that my body thinks are real. I still absolutely adore this segment. Scorpion feels genuinely creepy here, and at certain points, Peter hallucinates himself in the lab, slowly going through his mind talking with Otto at certain stages, and given that this is Peter's mind and no one else, this is what Peter thinks of himself after Otto had released the Devil's Breath. He has to stay calm and bright for the city's sake when he's out saving others and stopping bad guys, but when he's wrestling with his own conscience, he can't stop his darkest feelings beating him down worse than any Sinister Six ever could. Luckily, Peter is able to fight back against these thoughts, metaphorically at least. And after a quick fight with Scorpion, plural, he is finally able to create an antidote for the poison and finally escape from the mental hell. Where'd my suit go? After some quick reflection on some memories around the lab, and finding out how long Doc had been thinking of committing this, he goes back to Feast in order to check on May after the fire the previous night. This is where Peter finds out how sick May truly is, and encourages her to get some rest and let Miles take some of the responsibility. And as of now, he's on a supply run to get some medicine for the people at Feast. And when Peter tries to contact him, he doesn't answer. Most likely because the place he went to to go get supplies has been raided by Riker's inmates. After moving through a sea of dangerous convicts and finding the amoxicillin he needed, he finds that Scorpion and Rhino are also there, torturing some Sable guards. Miles grabs as many bottles as he can carry and makes a run for it, but when he tries to jump a nearby fence, he ends up making a little noise, prompting Rhino to chase after him. And like I said earlier, I really love this segment. Sure, Rhino is intimidating to Spider-Man, but he still beats him up and is able to hold his own against him. Miles, however, can't. And knowing this, it's genuinely terrifying sneaking around him, as one wrong move, and it's game over. Luckily for Miles, however, 
he is able to make it out safely and unharmed. But while he's walking away back to Feast, he notices an innocent man being harassed by some convicts. Initially, Miles ignores what they're doing, but after a bit of thought, he decides to try and stand up to the inmates, putting his hands up ready to fight, remembering what Spider-Man had taught him earlier. He waits for an opening, and is able to knock one of the criminals out in a single punch, to which the other just decides to leave, making Miles feel brave, and showing us that what Spider-Man did for him really mattered, but also showing us that he still has some areas he needs to work on. You want a taste? I gotta work on my fight banner. Miles tells Peter about his escapade, which gives him the information he needs about Rhino targeting relief centers. So, after finding him, we start another boss battle with the big fella. Pick on someone your own size, Rhino. There is no one my size, Hulk. Or maybe we could just talk it out. And heck, later down in the fight, Scorpion joins the fray. And unlike Electro and Vulture, who worked pretty well together and treated each other as if they were friends, Rhino and Scorpion pretty much hate each other's guts. And it's really hilarious seeing them bickering while you're trying to beat both of them up. This fight, instead of just being a regular old brawl, is more like a strategy-based fight. In order to attack Rhino, you need to line up his run under certain objects that can be dropped in order to stun him. And with Scorpion, you need to whip him up in order to have him fall down to the floor and you have to make sure you're dodging both their attacks simultaneously. It gets intense at points, but it's all about patience, timing, and planning. It's a pretty unique fight compared to the rest of them. Also, the rainy atmosphere I like too. And once you beat both of them, the two make up for all the fighting they've done. I mean, they probably will. Eventually. Once we finally get out of there, we have only two villains left to take care of, Lee and Otto, and MJ, wanting to look for the Oscorp lab that holds the antidote, decides to try and sneak into Norman's penthouse for clues. After sneaking past the Sable guards in the lobby, obtaining a stun gun and causing Norman to come down from his penthouse, MJ sneaks onto the elevator and makes her way up. While up here, she finds the entrance in a wall to a supposed secret room and also is able to reminisce about all the fun times she had with Pete and Harry when they were younger around here. It's just... nice. The lack of music, the big open and beautiful space, it's just... nice. But after finding a key that leads into Harry's room, she finds out that Harry, who was supposedly on a trip to Europe all this time, was not. In actuality, Harry was going into major treatment, something he picked up from his mom, and he admits that all the times he says he was busy or wasn't available to hang was just because he was sick, and that the Europe trip is just a cover for his treatment. But before MJ can find out anything else, she's interrupted by the return of Norman and Silver Sable, and Norman tells Sable off and says that he's going to the lab alone with no guards to protect him. Sure, he won't regret that. Anyways, MJ sneaks her way back to the hidden wall and makes it inside, finding a secret lab hidden behind it, with a diagram showing every Oscorp-owned property, a bunch of tanks showing test spiders with stuff like bioelectricity and camouflage juiced into it, and even a secret container holding... something. When MJ finds the location of the lab, she notices something on the files labeled GR27, the Martin Lee incident. And when she clicks on it, she discovers something equally as horrible as Harry's sickness. The fact that Norman and Otto created Mr. Negative. That they, or mostly Norman, were the ones responsible for cursing Lee with his powers. And to make things worse, these powers, when Lee just obtains them, are too much for him to handle, and he ends up taking the life of his own parents, 
explaining the entire reason why Lee has so much hatred for Norman, and the start of Otto's hatred for the same man. While MJ tries to collect this evidence, one of the spiders tries jumping at her, and it scares her, causing a container behind her to be knocked to the floor, completely shattering it, alerting Sable to her location. She gets the data just as Sable enters the room, and as Sable fails to simply look to her left, MJ notices one of the spiders crawling up her. Luckily, Sable leaves before it can do anything, and she is just fine. Making her way out to the balcony, she tells Peter that he better be ready to take action, as her plan is one that Peter cannot mess up. As to escape Sable and her guards, she takes a leap of faith right off the balcony. But before she splatters onto the ground, Spider-Man swoops in and catches her, swinging away unharmed. And on the swing back to Feast, MJ tells Peter about everything she found out. Everything. And it's almost too much for him to handle. But MJ reminds him that no matter how much he has lost, he isn't alone anymore. He has all the people at Feast, MJ, Miles, May, everyone. And that gives him all the reason he needs to get that cure and save everyone. But not before finding out that the spider from earlier somehow survived the trip back to Feast. Foreshadowing. On the way to the lab, Spider-Man calls Yuri and tells her what he found out. And Yuri tells him that there was recently a helicopter that went down in the area. Most likely Norman's helicopter. And once Pete arrives, it's bad. Demons are crawling all over the place and Norman has been taken hostage, being dragged into the building unwillingly. Once Spidey takes care of the demon guards, Sable then decides to show up to the party, and since he's still a priority target, they don't exactly treat him as a welcome guest. The exact opposite, in fact. And once Peter finally takes care of them, Silver Sable shows up out of nowhere and begins firing at Spider-Man, having him right at gunpoint. But after Pete talks her out of it by telling her that if they fight each other, Lee will just get away with whatever he's doing to Norman, and they'll both lose, Sable decides to form a temporary truce, at least until Osborne is safe. But when more demons start charging, she decides to stay back and fend them off, allowing Spider-Man to go find Norman himself. As Spider-Man makes his way down, he is once again attacked by Lee and forced into the negative zone, where Lee tries even harder to convince Spider-Man to join his side and give Norman his dues, telling him about all the pain he has inflicted on so many others, and how he deserves what's coming to him. But yet again, Spider-Man refuses and is able to escape the negative zone, and just when Lee secures the anti-serum and begins to try and take out Norman for good, Spidey swoops in and stops him, trying to convince him that this isn't the way that things turn out good, halting his onslaught for a split second, giving him time to think about his actions, before quickly letting the dark side take over again, beginning his second boss battle. And man, what a spectacle this fight is. I just have no words, it's incredible. Though Lee can be a bit cheesy at times. The demon. I am the demon. Once Spider Man finally defeats him and everything seems safe, Otto shows up out of nowhere and absolutely rocks Peter. Like, man, he does not hold back, and Peter doesn't even stand a chance. Just look at this. And once Peter's knocked out, Otto takes the anti serum and after a quick little reunion with Norman, kidnaps him too, asking him if he's ready for his final act, taking him away as Norman screams for help. Sable finally makes her way down to the room where Spider-Man fought Lee, and finds him nearly dead, worse off than when he fought the Sinister Six at the raft. And instead of leaving him be, Sable actually gets him up and begins to try and bring him to a hospital, but Peter doesn't want a hospital. He wants Feast. Once Peter makes it there, he is immediately brought to a table and thanks Sable for bringing him there, 
and all Miles and MJ can do is watch as they hope he can make it. After some time, he is finally in better condition, but needs to rest for a while. And in true Parker fashion, instead of doing that, he immediately gets up and begins making his way towards the door, asking where May is. And she isn't doing so hot either. She's on a bed, basically dying, and they're saying that she could go at any minute. Pete's scared. He doesn't want to lose the person who means the most to him, but he doesn't even know if he can beat Dr. Octavius. But MJ suggests that maybe all Spider-Man needs is help from his friend Peter Parker, telling him that maybe he just needs some brains to bring out the brawn. And with this, that set Spidey off, going to take back the anti-serum and going to destroy the impossible that he and Doc created. But as he takes his leave, the spider from earlier crawls its way down MJ's sleeve and makes its way down to the first floor and is quickly greeted by Miles's hand, to which it bites, leaving Miles a bit shocked, confused, and sort of uneasy. But there isn't any time to worry about that as of now, and as the rain begins to fall and as night falls further, he begins working on a suit that can counter Doc's arms, creating the anti-Auk suit. And when the news shows Osborne being taken hostage on live television, Peter swings off to go and rescue him. And here, we have Otto finally making Norman admit to all the things he has done wrong or else he threatens to throw him off the roof of Oscorp, claiming all of his accomplishments are built upon lies, that he stole his company and ideas, and even almost dropping him all the way down as a way to show how serious he is. Man, this is a... This is a really immaculate scene. I honestly cannot describe my love for it. And it gets better once Otto makes Norman tell the truth to everyone watching revealing his evil foundation himself. And Norman does tell the truth, at least in his eyes. The truth is, you were only ever worth a damn when you worked for me. The truth is, you could never accept that I'm better than you. You're a failure, Otto, and you always will be. <laughs> And with that, Otto tries to end him right then and there, not even having a sense of regret or even looking back. He just wants him gone, no matter what. But before Norman hits the ground, Spider-Man saves him and begins running up the building towards Otto, ready for the fight of his and the city's life. And when the two meet once again, Spider-Man having ignored the warnings to stay out of his way, it begins the final boss of the game, a climatic final showdown between two parties, one who has nothing to lose, and one who has everything to lose. Usually, in these fights, Peter always has some witty jokes or something to say to lighten the mood of the battle, but here, there are no witty remarks or anything like that. Peter is dead serious. He wants to try his best to convince Otto to stop his rampage and give him the anti-serum, but Otto won't give it to him until Osborne loses everything. So Peter keeps on fighting and dodging the arms, regretfully fighting the man he once admired. But once Peter is almost able to end the fight for good by ripping the neural interface off, Otto is able to stop him at the last moment, not only making him lose the chance at beating him, but disabling his webs, making the tower start tilting on its side, and even hitting him in the face so hard that part of his mask comes off. And as Peter starts panicking, not wanting to reveal his identity to Otto, Otto reveals something that he's known for a while. Such a disappointment. Parker. He knew. The whole time. He was lying when he merely thought Peter designed Spider-Man's equipment. 
he knew who was behind the mask every single time he ruthlessly beat him he knew exactly who he was causing so much pain to every single time the wall crawler got in his way and all Otto can simply say here is how he didn't listen to him how he should have just backed off and Peter Peter isn't stunned in shock he isn't left longing for answers no Peter is pissed the hell off you can hear just the amount of anger in his voice in both of their voices this means too much to me not more than it means to me and once the tower fully tilts and sends the two careening down the side of the building only to catch themselves on the side so begins what i consider one of the most emotionally impactful segments in any piece of media period not just video games but between shows movies everything it's a battle between a superhero and a supervillain but it's more than that it's a battle between a hero whose hero was the supervillain a battle between friends a battle between two people who were supposed to change the world but their ways of changing the world are too different and this fight with the intense and really good theme in the background the sirens and fire in the background and the rain adding to the atmosphere makes for a really intense fight where peter does not hold back against octavius giving him everything he's got showing him all the pain he's caused him telling him how much Otto meant to him, and Otto simply replies with how Peter can't save him. He's beyond help at this point, and the only option for Peter left is to let Otto save himself. But even with all this emotion behind him, it still isn't enough to take down Otto. Otto has him pinned, ready to drive his claws through his skin, taunting him with the anti-serum, and telling him that if he really wanted to change the world, he would need to be the kind of man to make the hardest decisions. And Peter couldn't agree more. And as Otto falls down the side of the building, anti-serum in hand, the two end up in a small room where Otto lays on a table, helpless, away from the rain, the fire, the lights, and the noise, just quiet. And remember how I said the start of the final phase was the beginning of one of the most emotional moments in all of media, at least of what I've seen? Yeah. That lasts throughout the entire rest of the ending. This game probably has one of the best conclusions to anything I've ever seen. So much emotion packed in, so much heartbreak, and you can see that here where Otto tries to convince Peter that his path was really justified, and that it was merely his duty to commit those acts for the betterment of the city. And dude, the voice acting of both Yuri and William peak here. You can feel every little emotion both parties are feeling. No, you're wrong! You are everything I wanted to be! You just threw it away! No! If they put me away, they'll take my arms! I'll be trapped in this useless body! And when Otto tries to convince Peter to give him another chance, saying that it wasn't really him doing all that stuff, and that he can rest easy knowing his secret is safe with him, it makes Peter contemplate the situation. He has to make a decision. A really, really hard decision. And he makes one. 
a decision that I cannot explain the impact of in words. So just watch. You do what you think is best, Doc. It's all any of us can. Be there. Even when it hurts like hell. Peter, where are you going? Peter! Peter! I... I usually never cry when it comes to fictional media, but this genuinely gets me every single time. It's the voice acting that truly does it for me. But so does all the buildup as well. All the times Peter remembers with Doc, and vice versa, have been thrown away. And Peter leaves Doc by his own choosing, leaving him there to be thrown in prison, left to rot in his soon-to-be non-functioning body. And the tears don't stop there. Peter brings the anti-serum to Dr. Michaels, who tells him that in order to create an antidote that's mass-producible, he'll need a few hours or maybe even a day to make it, and Aunt May may only have a few minutes left. But if he chooses to use the anti-serum on her, then there won't be enough for everyone else. And with that, Dr. Michaels and MJ leave the room, leaving Peter and May alone. And when Spider-Man walks up to her and promises that she'll be okay, May tells him something that she's known for quite some time. Take off your mask. I want to see my nephew. Just like Otto, she knew the whole time. But unlike with that, where Peter realized Otto did all those horrible things to him intentionally, he realizes that he now never has to feel bad for all the times he had to leave to go do Spider-Man work. All the times Pete thought he abandoned May was just shot down by May telling him that she knows why, and how she couldn't be prouder of him. Like at the feast fire, May didn't think that Peter never showed up, she knew that Peter dove into literal fire to rescue her and Miles, all the people he has saved, all the times he put his life on the line to protect a single life or the entire city. May was worried sick every single time he went out there, worried that he might not come back, but she always knew that he'd prevail, and she couldn't be happier, and she knows that Ben would be just as proud and happy as she is. But when Peter says that he doesn't know what to do now, the only thing she can reply with is that he does. And with that, she begins having a coughing fit and closes her eyes, and Peter has to make an even bigger and harder decision than when he left Doc. Does he save the most important person in his life, or does he save every other person's life? You know what I like to think Peter thought in this exact moment? The very last thing Ben ever told him before he ended up passing away. With great power comes great responsibility. And in that moment, when Peter thinks about those words, he realizes that May was right. He does know what to do. He puts down the antidote and leaves it be and decides to spend the last moments he has with May, not begging her to stay with him, not giving her any impactful final words. All he does is drop down and cry. And he just keeps crying. Until... There's a lot I want to say on the scene, but I just can't find the words. So, I'll just say this. Remember that late grandmother and late 
grandfather, Mima and Papa, that I both talked about earlier, it, it really sucked to lose both of them. But Peter, that I can see myself in, and someone that I want to see even more of myself in. Someone who has a lot of bad moments, but no matter how many times he's beat down, or what he loses, he doesn't let them put him down. He keeps getting back up every single time with a smile on his face. He still knows how many people he can rely on. And I can even see a lot of those grandparents in May and Ben as well. It feels like these characters were made specifically for me. Obviously, it's not the case, but it makes this ending stick out to me ten times more. So with that, all I want to do is thank my Mima and Papa for everything. And with that, the battle is over. A cure for Devil's Breath is created and quickly given out to everyone. A funeral is held for Aunt May, engraving the quote that she had been saying throughout the game. When you help someone, you help everyone. And Otto is sent to prison, left mad by the things that have happened to him. And with the face he makes before the screen cuts to black, it's possible that we haven't seen the last of him. Cutting back to Peter three months later, MJ got a promotion to associate editor, and Peter talks about how he's still looking for a new job. Pete has also since bought a new place to live, but because he says it won't be ready for about a week or so, he tells MJ that he'll be crashing with Miles until then. And after he says that, MJ suggests that maybe he could stay at her place. Okay, buddy. And finally, after some awkward asking, the two end up- Whoa! Okay, cover your eyes, kids! I thought this was rated T for Teen Insomniac! Whew! Okay, moving on from that, the credits start rolling. And man, when these credits started playing, I was just in shock and awe. Honestly, I just wanted to clap when it was over. What an incredible game. And we still have two post credit sequences. The first shows Peter having Miles help him move into his new home. And this is when Miles decides to tell Peter something that he doesn't really want to tell his mom about. And it's really funny how Peter thinks he's talking about puberty. No. For example, not that. Uh, I think it's, I think it's better that I just, um, I show you. I show you. No, 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 no. Revealing that he has the same kind of powers as Peter. Peter weird, is right? no longer the only Spider-Man in town. This gives us a lead as to what happens in the DLC, and also Miles Morales. But what happens next leads past those games, and directly into the sequel, finally showing us what was inside that container. It was Harry, surrounded by what looks like the symbiote. This is something that the second game is directly going to tackle, and I cannot wait to see what they do with it. And with that, the story is finished. The city is safe, Yuri and the police are back in the game, Sable left to her home country, and even Yuri finally recognizes a certain half-cop, half-spider as a reliable member of the Force. Not you. For a job this tough, we need Spider-Cop. <laughs> You said it! You even did the voice! Okay, don't make it weird. You like me! You really like me! You made it weird. And... That's it. I'm done. Dude, I cannot put into words how incredible this game's plot and the game in general is. I had my nitpicks about the traversal and combat systems and some of the side content, but the story is something I think is genuinely perfect in this game. It hits just the right beats, shows us some wonderful characters that are extremely likable, relatable, and make you laugh and cry. The game isn't afraid to be serious and let us lose things. 
but it also makes sure that we're always hopeful for the future, that there's always that glimmer of hope left in the tragedy. Never before have I shown so much care for a game's characters and plot. Never before have I showed so much emotion for the things that happen in a fictional world. I know, for a fact, I would not have loved this game nearly as much as I do if it weren't for how good this story is. It's the best plot I've ever experienced in a game. And while it isn't the entire reason, it's the main reason that this, Marvel's Spider-Man, is my favorite video game of all time. That's probably going to be beaten in however many days left until Spider-Man 2 comes out. If it isn't out already. Oh my lord, that, that was a lot. This script took me more than a month to write. Partly because I've been so dang busy and haven't had too terribly long to work on this. But man, I do not regret making this video at all. I'm really glad that I was able to really show how much I love this game. It was certainly a long journey creating this for y'all, but I think it was worth it. Since I've played the first game, I ended up selling my PlayStation 4 in favor of buying a PlayStation 5 because... Why not? And what do you think the first game I got for that system was? I mean, obviously it was Astro's Playroom, of course it was Miles Morales! Along with Sackboy's Big Adventure and the Kingdom Hearts Collection, plus the third one. I beat the first game in that series and haven't made much more progress. I should probably make some more progress on 2 though, since that's King's favorite video game of all time. Maybe I will sometime soon. But oh man, I was so into Miles Morales. I definitely think the first one is a better overall game, as well as package, but Miles Morales is definitely an improvement on its core mechanics. Something that they are taking into account with Spider-Man 2, releasing in around a few days, maybe? I have no idea when I'm getting this out, alright? And with the way it's looking, I think it's pretty possible that this one will be taking the crown for my favorite game. Oh man, I am so excited. Thank you so, 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 so much if you made it this far into the video. I truly appreciate it a lot. And again, make sure you check out Capsirius' video on the Kirby series that I mentioned earlier, as well as the review that the comic book burrito is doing on Spider-Man 2 about a week after the game's release. And for the sake of not dragging out this outro any longer, I'm gonna end it here. Follow me on Twitter, watch some other videos of mine, and I am going to go rest now. I'll be seeing y'all later. Bye.